Hello, my name is Lowell Vanderpool and this channel is dedicated to IT students, IT professionals, and anyone who enjoys learning technical subjects. Our topic will be Windows and Containers. Now, Containers is a developer, programmer ecosystem. Microsoft was late to the table on Containers. Linux was using Containers a long time prior to Windows really having to take a serious look and re-engineering Windows so that it could also use Containers. We're gonna look at what Containers are, why developers and programmers love them. We're going to look at the two features in Linux that make containers work. And we'll look at how Microsoft had to re-engineer Windows in order to bring containers to the Windows platform. So hang on, let's get going. Now containers are really about a form of application virtualization. Now, Microsoft wasn't new to this subject. They had AppV. They had looked at application virtualization to some degree, but all these developers and programmers were running to this world of containers and Microsoft was nowhere to be found. They had to seriously look at containers. So what is a container? Well, a container is very much like that metal box we see on these large ships here. That metal box, you can put goods and items inside there, lock it up, and you can take that metal box and you can put it on a ship, you can put it on a train, you can put it on a truck, and the goods and material inside that metal box stay the same. This simple concept is what programmers wanted. They wanted a box, and they wanted to put their applications in it, and they wanted to put it on the cloud, on a server, or on a laptop, and it still ran. That's what containers are. Think about VMware and Hyper-V, they virtualize hardware. That's very important. Containers virtualize the operating system. So with containers, it allows a software developer to take his laptop, Windows 10, build an application, run and test it. He can take that container off his Windows 10 laptop, move it to a, a corporate data center, run it on their own internal servers. He can also migrate it to Azure Cloud or AWS or anything else. And that application runs just like it did on his Windows 10 laptop. Programmers love this stuff. Now there's some really entrepreneurial type of people out there that take those metal boxes, those containers that we ship goods on ships and they turn them into, well, Based on your imagination, you can turn those metal boxes into just about anything. Software developers are taking software containers and they're doing amazing things with them. All right, so let's talk for a second Windows containers, just Windows containers. There's two basic types. There's Hyper-V isolation containers, and these would be containers inside a Hyper-V environment. They provide really good isolation and security barriers, but they require more CPU, memory, and storage requirements, and they're larger in size in terms of file size. There's also a type of container for Windows called processor-based, and this has good isolation, limited security barriers, very efficient use of the operating system and hardware. Uh, you wouldn't want to use it on a multi-tenant environment, say in a cloud. It doesn't provide enough protection, but it has its advantages. So those are two kinds of Windows containers. You know, those metal box containers, they think of so many cool ways to use those things. So someone would want to ask me and said, okay, are Linux and Windows containers the same? I found an interesting article written by a Google engineer who should know because he did a number of software vulnerabilities for Project Zero for Windows containers. And he said this, Windows 10 and 
and its server counterparts add support for application containerization. The implementation in Windows is similar in concept to Linux containers, but of course, wildly different. So yes, Windows and Linux containers are similar in concept. How Microsoft implemented containers is really different than Linux. Before Linux could ever embrace the concept of containers, there was a modification in its kernel in 2006. That modification gave birth to what is known as cgroups. Cgroups allow processes, taking groups of processes together under a common set of resources and allowed this cgroup to control a number of processes at one time. With cgroups and a feature called namespaces, these two feature sets allowed Linux to start the embracing of the idea of containers. Now, Windows had a feature like Linux cgroups, and it was called Windows Job Objects. Now, with Windows containers, Windows did have something like this Linux C groups and it called it job objects. It allowed groups of processes to be managed as a single unit. Now to discuss a lot of the technology that we're going to be looking at in containers, I'm going to be going to Windows System Internals and I'm going to be using Process Explorer. So you go to Windows System Internals and you can download Process Explorer. Mark Persenovich wrote Process Explorer because it simply shows me a lot more about user mode processes. I'm going to be using that tool to talk about containers. So here's my running version of Process Explorer. And if you scroll down, you can see it's color coded so it helps us understand what's going on when we look at all of these user mode processes. I'm going to go into options and Mark has given us the ability to color code so we can see certain facets of the operating system. And one, if you notice, if I check this brown, this allows me to see all the processes that are being controlled by a job. So I'm going to go ahead and say OK. And we're going to see a lot of brown showing up. So I see a lot of my processes are being run by jobs. So I'm going to come up here to Google Drive and I'm going to right mouse click. And you can see that the parent process, which is 14884, and there's a number of child processes below it for Google Drive. And notice they're all brown. So if I right mouse click the parent, I'm going to go to properties and I'm going to pull up the jobs tab. And you can see that all of those child processes are in the same job as the parent. If you go look at all these PIDs, they will match what we have in this list here. And what it does is it allows this job to control both the parent and the child process as one single unit. This is very powerful. We're going to see this being used very, very effectively for containers. But this is what we're talking about when we talk about jobs controlling processes. So when a developer puts its processes into a job, very interesting things can happen. One, they all work as a single unit. You can set the job to say, this is how many active processes that can we have. That's it. We can limit those processes to how much CPU they can access. We can even drill down and say, this process in the job can only have this much CPU access. We could say, these processes in the job can only act so much virtual memory, or they can only use so much of our network, or they can only use so much disk I.O. So you can see jobs can be very, very powerful to the developer. Now, this is not an, a comprehensive list of things that you can do with jobs, but let's say, let me just give you one more. If we terminate, we can put a, a requirement that if we terminate the parent, that all the child processes also must be terminated. So this kind of gives you the idea of the control of jobs over processes. Now, when it came to the Linux namespaces, which was an important feature of Linux to run containers, Microsoft didn't have anything like it. So they had to engineer from this ground up a new feature called server silo. Now, in order for Windows to run containers, they had to come up with this namespaces-like feature in Windows. What they did was they created a kernel object that could be talked to from user mode, and it was called server silo, and it was going to be the key thing that isolated functions in user mode from the kernel. If we're not careful as we move ahead with containers, remember this is a programmer and developer world, and they use terms and language 
languages that IT professionals are not as comfortable with. Sometimes they use our terms for something totally different. We're going to move forward very, very carefully. All right, let's get into container basics. This diagram is a great way to start. You can see I've got, you see a laptop, a server, a cloud. That represents any kind of hardware. Could be your data center, your laptop at home, or Azure, AWS, etc. So we don't really care about hardware. Then you have your operating system, the Docker engine, and then those, the green app one and its binary and libraries, app two, binary and libraries, app three, binary and libraries. This is kind of like the container basics. So a container is an isolated, lightweight container running an application on a host OS. Containers build on top of the host OS kernel. So if I'm running Windows containers, they need to see a Windows operating system. If I'm running containers built for Linux, I need to see a Linux operating system down there. Doesn't matter whether I'm on AWS or a data center or on my laptop, I need to have Linux down there. So when I build a container, Linux container, it needs to see a Linux operating system. It can have all kinds of hardware down there, but it's got to have that Linux operating system. Okay, Mr. V, I'm with you, but what, a, what is this about binaries and libraries and containers for an application? Let's go to my C drive. I'm going to take Explorer and I'm going to go to Windows. I'm going to double click and I'm going to scroll down to System32. System32 is a major, major file. As I scroll through this directory, System32, Windows, System32, in here, let me get out of the folder area, all these files that you see here, and I could just scroll a long, long time. These are known as the files that run are actually the libraries and binaries so that in any application that you could ever think you would ever install on Windows can run. That's where they are. Windows System 32. Now the operating system uses these, but primarily the largest percentage of these are so that applications can call these binaries and libraries of files so that they can run in Windows. Now there's a lot of them here. Let me go to Windows and I go to the properties of System 32 and scroll up. Look at the size. 4.67 gigabytes. Now that's a lot of files, binaries and libraries, and I need them so that I can support all the various applications that I would ever want to install on Windows. But what if I want to run just Notepad? Do I need 4.67 gigabytes of binaries and libraries to run my mission critical Notepad? You guessed it. No, you don't. Just to be more specific, I've, I'm in System32 and I'm going to go over to search and I'm going to search for DLLs, all the DLLs. And these are, these are the libraries and binaries that applications run on. If you'll notice at the bottom, there's over 4,452 items in the System32 directory that are just DLLs. We don't need all of these to run, say, a single app. And that's the beauty of containers. What if I could take out of these 4,452 files, take only the DLLs that I need to run my enterprise version of Notepad and throw it into a container? Yeah, my container would be pretty small considering 4.67 gigabytes of files that I need to run any program in the world. So let me show you. So I'm back to Process Explorer and I've actually got Notepad running. Here's my critical enterprise version of Notepad. Everybody needs Notepad. What do I need in terms of binaries and libraries to run Notepad? So in Process Explorer, I'm going to scroll down here till I find Notepad and there it is. And I'm going to come up and I'm going to create a lower pane. And this lower pane allows me to see inside Notepad what's involved in it. And in the lower pane, I'm going to come over here and view in the lower pane. I'm going to look at just DLLs that are needed, binaries and libraries that are needed to run Notepad. And there they are. So I've got Notepad highlighted up here. Down here in the lower pane, I see all the binaries and libraries needed to run Notepad. And it looks to me that most of them are in System32. If you look over here in the path, there can't be more than 
50, 30, okay, not too many. What if I copied those out and I put them into a container and I threw Notepad on them? Would Notepad run? Yes, if I have other structures inside there, I probably could run Notepad with 30 files. Are you getting the idea of containers? Now I could take that container with these 30 files in Notepad and I could run my enterprise version of Notepad in Azure or AWS or data center server. Why not? That's the beauty of containers. Instead of 4,000, DLLs that I don't need or 4.7 gigs of libraries and files that I don't need. Why couldn't I take out just the libraries and binaries that I need to run Notepad, throw them in container and voila, I've got Notepad. So Mr. Vanderpool, is it really just that simple? Well, no, but you do get the idea. Containers build on top of the kernel. Containers need some kernel function. If they want to access the file system or the network or cryptological functions, if the app needs it, they got to talk to the kernel. But most of the APIs are provided by those system libraries we just looked at, and they run in user mode. A container needs its own copy of these files. These are known as base images. That includes a lean in Windows world, these base images contain those files as well as a lean version of Windows. Now containers get only an isolated view of the OS kernel. We have a host OS, but we only want them to get an isolated view. In Windows, a container gets a virtualized view of the file system, the registry, and objects. Any change my, made by the application only affects that container. And if we stop the container, all the changes are discarded. Wait a minute, Mr. Rule. If I've got Microsoft Word running in a container, I don't want all my documents to be lost. Well, they will be because that's how containers work. Now you can mount a permanent storage mount inside of a container. So you could save things if the application needed to save it. But one thing to understand about containers, once you turn them off, all the changes that were made during the runtime, they're gone. So let me give you an idea of how we virtualize the container as it looks at the operating system. Let's say you're a regular user on a laptop and you want to access C colon backslash secrets.txt. Windows will represent that C colon with something like this, a path, device backslash hard disk volume four, and that represents C drive. But if you're in a container on that laptop and you access C colon backslash secret.txt, Windows is not going to show you C drive the same way. It's going to show it like this, a path device backslash slash VHD hard disk and maybe a number or a GUID. It's not going to show you the actual path to see. So remember, one of the goals of the server silo is to prevent a container from really seeing the, the kernel. So one of the primary goals of a container is to hide the real OS from any application. That's what the server silo functionality does. Now let's dig a little bit deeper into containers. I've got a hypervisor, I've got Windows Server, Docker Engine, and then two containers in a virtual machine. Over here, I've got Linux, a Docker Engine, and I've got three containers. Notice Notice some of the interesting things. Let's go over here to Windows Server. We can see that they share a lot of libraries and binaries. So obviously the applications need the same kind of libraries and binaries and they need Windows Server. So that's interesting. Over here on the Linux side, we have three containers. One has its own unique set of libraries and binaries. It doesn't share any of those with these other two on the far left. Now the two far left containers share a lot of libraries and binaries. They obviously, whatever app is running in there, needs those same similar type libraries and binaries, but all three containers need Linux below as a host. Let's go back to this fact. Windows containers can run in Hyper-V or they can run in what is known as processor-based virtualization. There's some advantage and disadvantage. Let's take a look at some advantages and disadvantages. Okay, I've got two physical servers. They're running Windows Server. One has Hyper-V and each of these containers are isolated from each other via Hyper-V. Because I have to put an operating system inside of every container, they take up more space, I can run fewer of them on this server. With processor isolation containers, I can run a lot more containers on the same physical server. So this would be where security is not as important, isolation is not as life-threatening. Over here, security is more important, isolation between the containers 
containers is more important. You can see some of the advantages and disadvantages here. Now containers can use processor-based isolation or sandboxing, but only on Windows Server. You cannot use this type of container on Windows 10. Now let's go back to Docker containers for Windows. Microsoft provides a variety of images for containers. They have Windows Server Core, and it provides some server functionality, traditional .NET frameworks. It's about 1.4 gigabytes in size. Then it also provides Nano Server, which is basically .NET, that's it. 94 megabytes in size. That's amazing. And then they have a full Windows, which provides a rich set of APIs and a lot of server functionality. That's 3.5 gigabytes. They also have Windows IoT Core, which I could not find for my life the size of that image. You are not constrained to Windows. You can also download a variety of Linux, Ubuntu, Alpine, Debian, Amazon Linux. There's a lot of choices on the Linux side. Docker supports a wide variety of platforms, Mac with Intel chip, Mac with Apple chip, Windows, and Linux. Docker Enterprise is pre-installed on every Windows Server 2016 and above.